Good morning. Thank you very much to the hearty souls who have joined us nice and bright and early for the start of the sessions this morning. I hope you're here because you're interested in the session called What If Machines Outsmart Us All? Um, this promises to be a very intriguing discussion. I'm Mariette DeCristina. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. I am also the Chair of the Meta Council for Emerging Technologies of the Global Agenda Councils. And um, with me today are um, Tom Mitchell of, of Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome. Yuchiro Ansai, the President of Japan Society for Promotion of Science. Welcome. Stuart Russell of the University of California at Berkeley. Welcome. And Dilip George, co-founder and CTO of Vicarious. Welcome. This session today, um, which I'm going to ask this, the speakers to, to speak to in a minute, is part of a series of sessions on emerging technologies and socially disruptive technologies that will be going on at the forum this, um, this week. This talks about deep learning algorithms and how they draw powerful insights from the massive amounts of data, many of which not those of us who are only merely human, can not hope to, um, to understand in completion. And they, we will take a look at some of the probable and possible causes and effects on society and on the way we live today through this session. And I also, um, I hope you will um, be able to take a look at some of the sessions on disruptive technologies generally. So I'd like to, uh, because it's early, um, well, I'm going to uh, ask you in just a minute to think about um, some, some questions and maybe take, we're going to take some audience votes. But before then, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to speak a little bit about how they're thinking of machines and deep learning and AI and um, the sort of issues that are on their minds. Can I start with you, please? Thanks. Um, so I just want to make a few observations. The first one really begins with the title of this session, What If Computers Outsmart Us All? And it reminds me of some friends of mine who talk about the possibility of an upcoming singularity when computers suddenly become smarter than us. But my point is this. Um, computers are already smarter than us in many ways and dumber than us in many other ways. So they um, certainly do arithmetic and multiplication better than I do. They analyze brain image data better than a person can. They uh, help me find uh, pages on the web better than I could if I had to go through them by hand. So there are plenty of ways already that computers outsmart us. And it's an interesting observation that each of those examples and all the others I can think of so far have been cases where once the computer became better than I am, it helped me become smarter. I make fewer arithmetic errors because I build on this computer expertise. So that's one point to think about. Second is the uh, concern that I have, or at least a high impact, I think, on society that will come from advances in AI, and that is uh, the economic impact on jobs. So computers um, are already replacing automating many things that people do. More of that is coming. Computers will be able to drive cars autonomously, for example, and there are a lot of jobs that will be impacted by that. So um, that's an issue that I do think is worth discussion consideration. My one sentence summary of my position on that is automation grows the wealth pie. Who can be against that? But automation is also bad for wealth distribution if we keep the same distribution scheme we have now because a smaller and smaller number of people will own the wealth. They will be the ones who own the automation. Uh, the final point I want to make is really about privacy. And think about how AI and intelligent computers are going to change our whole notion of privacy. So right now, um, I have probably the thing that has the most data about me on Earth, in, except for my wife, is this. <laughs> and uh, as it becomes smarter and smarter, it will uh, probably also have more and more information about me because it will be able to infer it. Uh, so this will have very interesting impacts on our whole notion of privacy. Think about the difference between 
whether you've ever been embarrassed that a person found out something about you versus whether you've ever been embarrassed that a computer found out something about you. I've never been embarrassed in front of my phone yet. Thank you. I started my work in machine learning around uh, 40 years ago at Carnegie Mellon, where uh, Tom is uh, working very earnestly right now. And uh, at that time, the AI or you know, machine learning was uh, kind of single purpose, you know, uh, just for uh, automating uh, people's job and other things. And uh, in Japan, uh, now where Shogi is suppressed by AI uh, program, and uh, uh, you know, high level professionals are beaten by sh uh, Shogi you know, software. And that sort of single-purpose AI is now uh, you know, supposed to overcome by uh, more general-purpose or AI programs that combine uh, you know, or, uh, so, uh, many kinds of uh, functions. I, went, I started my work in uh, human-robot interaction around 20 years ago. And uh, to make a smooth interaction with robots, that's a very difficult uh, job uh, for machines, since uh, humans take uh, very subtle actions, or you know, facial expressions and uh, verbal expressions, and it's not quite easy for uh, AI programs to, to you know, uh, understand the very subtle expressions and feelings of human beings. But the uh, I believe that. Uh, technology will uh, you know, overcome that sort of multiple you know, uh, uh, functions for uh, machines, and that's one point. And when will it be you know, uh, succeeded? Uh, I mean, will it be successful? I, I don't. 2045 or 2035, uh, we should discuss about that. that. But anyway, that's one point. Artificial general intelligence uh, would come around, in a sense. And second point is that uh, 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 the learning, I mean, uh, AI programs uh, help us to learn more and or uh, to design uh, more beautiful things or to help us uh, to create art and uh, uh, or medical care, very sort of things. And that sort of uh, feels uh, particular for business, uh, education, medical care, design, and th those kind of uh, fields were not quite popular in the business world. But uh, they would come around uh, in the very near future, and those fields are all uh, concerned with the human you know, internal cognitive processes. And so I believe that cognitive sciences, cognitive computing, or uh, cognitive, you know, computational or you know, uh, academia uh, would be more combined with artificial intelligence business. That's the uh, second point. Third point is the same, ELSI, you know, ethical, legal, and social issues and implications uh, would be the very important thing for us to discuss about and to realize uh, some laws for robots and uh, AI programs that should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, like Dr. Anzai, I wrote my first machine learning program about 40 years ago, uh, long before I was born. And um, uh, AI is, is, in my view, by far the coolest thing you can possibly study, uh, with the possible exception of, of the fundamental theories of physics. Uh, it's an enormous mystery, and it has incredible potential, because everything we have as human beings comes from from being intelligent. And if we can uh, magnify that intelligence, if we can make systems that we can use to solve problems that we can't solve unaided, uh, then the benefits for humanity are immeasurable. And so that's one of the reasons why people are so excited today uh, and why there's such a huge level of investment uh, in industry. And, uh, and partly as a result of that, ex uh, that excitement and that investment, we're seeing a lot of technological progress. The, the rate of things happening which leaves uh, relatively experienced uh, people like Tom and, and Dr. Anzai and myself rather surprised uh, that we didn't expect that these things would be possible 
uh, at, at this uh, time. So uh, with this progress, there's bound to be impact on the real world. And because of that impact, the general public are seeing stories in the media uh, about uh, robots that are going to kill us all, about the end of, it, uh, end of jobs, as Tom mentioned, uh, and even the end of humanity. Um, so how real are those questions? Uh, on the question of robots that are going to uh, kill us all, extremely real. Uh, right now, defense departments, governments around the world, companies are designing uh, and creating robots that will be able to uh, autonomously, i.e. without human direct control, uh, find and kill human targets. The United Nations is working hard to prevent this, uh, and this is a very important subject uh, right now. This is not for the future, this is today. Uh, on the question of jobs, there was a meeting in Davos uh, earlier this year of very uh, distinguished economists, Nobel Prize winners, one after the other, they got up and said that uh, the disruption of employment by robotics is the biggest threat facing the world economy. And their solution was that we need more unemployment insurance. Um, so I think we need to put a bit of thought into that question. Um, and then on the, the last question, the end of humanity, this really comes from uh, the possibility of creating general purpose intelligence. There is no real threat to humanity from uh, better versions of Google, from machine translation systems, uh, from medical diagnosis systems, and so on. But systems that are generally intelligent, that can quickly learn about any domain that they're faced with, uh, if they're able to make decisions better than humans, that means taking into account more information, looking further ahead into the future, then you can think of them as like the chess programs or the shogi programs that already defeat us uh, you know, with their eyes closed and their hands behind their back. Um, but instead of playing chess just for you know, the glory of victory across the board, we're playing chess with those machines for the world. We don't want to be playing chess with those machines for the world. We want to make sure that those machines are on our side. Uh, and that's the big challenge if we look uh, 30, 50 years ahead into the future, is how to make sure in a provable mathematical sense that the machines are 100% on our side. Uh, being the last speaker, I have to think about something original that others haven't uh, covered already. Um, so I do think uh, we should develop uh, AI and uh, be smarter than humans. Um, they are, it is smarter than humans in many specific tasks already, and it is going to be, it's going to get smarter and uh, exceed human intelligence at some point. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is very clear that we have to do this carefully. And this is not just about intelligence. Whenever we give autonomy to systems, even if those are not uh, generally intelligent, whenever we give autonomy to systems, software systems or hardware systems, or things that operate in the world, we have to be extremely careful that the outcome is as we expect. So for example, when we make cars being driven autonomously, we have to make sure that the outcome is what we are expecting. And this becomes uh, more challenging as intelligence becomes more general, and um, you know, as Stuart said, um, we need to ensure that the outcome is uh, rigorously tested and uh, provable. Uh, that's one aspect. Uh, another thing that I want to address that others uh, didn't touch upon is uh, this metaphor of uh, we being slave to machines. Uh, you know, we hear this all the time. You know, will uh, humans be slave to machines? Uh, I want to turn that on its head. In some sense, uh, we are slave to machines now. Uh, look about, think, think about the cities that we create. We create the cities uh, to drive cars in them, and we create infrastructure for cars, to, you know, we, for parking, for driving, et cetera. Uh, think about agriculture. Uh, we, we make agricultural systems to fit what the machines can do today. So if you, if you fly over United States, you will see these circular fields because uh, irrigation equipment uh, goes in circles. Uh, and so we create our agriculture to fit the machine's needs. So when machines become smarter, 
this will change. They will be more like us, and they will be true partners uh, in what we are doing. They will start understanding what we need to, what, what our uh, desire is uh, much more. Of course, we have to ensure that that's the way it is going to uh, progress. Um, so that's mine. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I hope you found that as interesting as I did, hearing these different perspectives. And now I, I think it would be great to hear the audience by way of voting, since it's, it's early and I think it's fun to get involved. Before the, um, the conference, there were poll questions put out uh, by the forum, and so we have some public responses to share. But I'd, I'd like to read to, to you the questions that were asked and ask you all to just by hands to keep it easy, although I'm sure we could have done it with phones, but just by hands to keep it easy, see what the tenor of the room is on three quick questions. The first is, if you were brought to trial, falsely accused of committing a serious crime, would you rather be judged by a human judge or an AI judge? Put your hand up first if you'd rather be judged by a human judge. That looks like a pretty strong majority. <laughs> How about the people who would trust in an AI judge? Huh? Some, some hearty souls there. <laughs> How about the second question? These are fun. Serious, though. If you were diagnosed with a life-limiting illness and a human doctor prescribed you with treatment regime A and an AI doctor prescribed you with a second treatment regime B, which course of treatment would you follow? Put your hand up if you would follow the human doctor's treatment course. Not so many. Put your hand up if you'd follow the AI doctor's treatment course. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was a majority, I think. <laughs> okay, we saved, I think, a very serious one for last. Um, third question. If your country was suddenly at war, would you want to be defended by the sons and daughters of your community? or an autonomous AI weapon system? Put your hand, oops, give a chance. Would you like to be defended by uh, human soldiers? Almost no one. AI soldiers. Stuart, you had a good flip to this question. Would you ask that also, just for Yeah, so, the, so the question that you were just asked was, would you like to be defended by AI weapons? Uh, so let me ask if you'd like to be attacked by AI weapons. Uh, because the, the idea that, that only your country will get to have the AI weapons is obviously fiction. Uh, and then the second question is, if both sides have AI weapons and one side's AI weapons win, what happens next? Well, then the AI weapons attack the humans, because the purpose of having a war is to get the humans to do what they don't want to do. Uh, so there, there is no end to a war after the AI systems have had their little fight. Uh, that's when the real war starts. I'd like to come back to that in just one minute. Um, maybe the audience would like to see if we could how the public voted on those three questions. I think we had them summarized. So the questions were the first one there. If your country was suddenly, well, this was the last one for us, but it's the first one on this slide. If your country was suddenly at war, would you want to be defended by the sons and daughters of your community or by an autonomous AI weapon system? And uh, there the majority of the public also agreed with the room. In the second question, if you were diagnosed with a life-limiting illness, and a human doctor prescribed you with treatment regime A, and an AI doctor prescribed you with treatment regime B, which course of treatment would you follow? The public was rather close in the vote there compared with the room, which is interesting. Maybe we've self-selected 
people who are interested in AI here. <laughs> and the last question, if you were brought to trial falsely accused of committing a serious crime, would you rather be judged by a human judge or an AI judge? And here the public agreed with the room here, vastly preferring a human judge. I think one thing that I'd like to just pose to the, the panelists, the speakers here, is, is why we might see such different responses to those kinds of questions. I think maybe. maybe well, I voted on this. question number two myself. Um, so uh, the medical one. I voted for the human doctor today. The reason is I've never seen an AI program be able to debate a human doctor and win. So I think explainability is a key part of the trust that we're going to need to develop if we're going to trust computers to, to make those decisions. And so uh, computers today are just not yet at the point where they can make good explanations, even if they're making outstanding decisions. Anything else? For, uh, on the law side, uh, I think uh, AI systems can play a big role in ensuring that the laws are consistent. So rather than on the application of the law side, it can be in checking the laws. You know, when we when we write these uh, volumes of you know 300 pages uh, new uh, laws, there are you know AI systems can play a role in making sure that there are no loopholes. Uh, they are consistent with each other, so that when something is challenged. Uh, two years down the line, three years down the line, there is no inadvertent, inadvertent mistake that got into the text of the law. Yeah, I think for the most part, medicine involves a fairly constrained system, which is the human body, whereas law in some ways incorporates everything about understand whether the law applies in particular ways to the particular case. Um, as, as Dilip said, um, laws can be analyzed if they're clearly uh, written. Um, there was a case of the, the citizenship laws of the United Kingdom, uh, which were translated into the prologue language, uh, which is the computer language that machines can understand. Uh, and then the machine actually found that the law was, was inconsistent with itself. So it was possible for someone to be a citizen and a non-citizen at the same time. So as a result, they actually had to fix the law to, to make it consistent. Uh, I like to be diagnosed by a, a very well-trained well well -trained doctor. You know, I like to be judged by a, a very fair judge. You know. And the humans are very distributed, you know, minds are distributed. And uh, there are some uh, studies in psychology that uh, for uh, minds, you know, uh, and mind workings of, uh, of judges, and they are very distributed. And uh, so are, uh, and AI systems are now growing and uh, uh, being developed uh, very, well, of course, very rapidly. And I agree with that uh, for medical diagnosis and some disease, uh, I like to be judged by AI doctor. And, but for judges, still, uh, you know, uh, humans, uh, you know, minds are very distributed, but still, uh, you know, AI is uh, following human beings, I think. Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's worth mentioning that I believe in Pennsylvania, they are using a machine learning algorithm to judge parole cases uh, based on uh, indicators of the behavior of, of the candidate for parole and the nature of the crime uh, and other characteristics. Um, they've also shown that, uh, I think, judges in Israel who are deciding parole cases, uh, the percentage of time that they grant parole uh, declines dramatically from the time right after breakfast when they're feeling good uh, to the time right before lunch when they're tired and hungry and hot. Uh, so it goes from like 63% down to something close to zero. So I think the answer is if you're going to be judged by a human judge, have it right after breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can I just uh, riff on that one point? Yeah. Um, I think many of these questions about would you have a computer or a person do this are missing the point that so far whenever computers get smart, us humans use that to make us smarter. 
And so if we go back to the case, which I don't know the details of, of Pennsylvania using computers to make parole decisions, um, my guess is that there's a human judge there taking the advice of this computer, which has looked at a lot more data than that judge has. And so I think that's another case of computers outsmarting us, but then making us ourselves smarter. So many of these uh, questions that we're thinking about, except for the war one, um, are really a question of not either computer or person, but perhaps person informed by computer. One point I think uh, long being missed by your AI researchers uh, is, uh, is uh, trust, as uh, Tom mentioned. You know, how we you know, human beings can trust each other uh, it is, uh, of course, concerned with uh, intelligence, but uh, uh, not just at all. I mean, uh, we, I've been working in the field of human-robot interaction and uh, how humans can, tr be, can trust in robots. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, you know, research field. And it really depends on the, how robots and humans converse each other, you know, make conversations, and how uh, you know, we can be you know, absorbed into robot's mind. And that sort of uh, you know, behavior or you know, uh, cognitive emotional processes are very important for future AI technology, I, I believe. So, so far, this is maybe a, a good time to just synthesize just a bit. So far, when we ask the question, what if machines outsmart us? I think, I think it's interesting how the panel's been addressing this so far. I mean, we've mentioned that so far machines are smarter than us in certain ways. Uh, we've, meant, we've mentioned that um, we, um, we see economic impacts from that, social and privacy impacts, even uh, questions about our humanity and our way forward and how do we trust them. I, I heard we want to be sure that these machines are 100% on our, on our side, ultimately and also that they can help us uh, to be better ourselves in many ways. So um, I think we've been gainfully looking at things that are nearer or farther away. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask you, what, what is the one, if you could pick one, most exciting or urgent area that needs to be addressed in this, in, in this realm right now? What's on your mind most heavily? Maybe I can guess yours. Um, so. As I mentioned earlier, the, the question of autonomous weapons is, uh, is quite urgent. So the United Nations has run three meetings uh, already. Um, the last one in April, I was invited to, uh, to address and explain uh, how autonomous systems worked uh, and what the likely future evolution of uh, intelligent robots uh, would be in the, in the sphere of warfare. Uh, and I think we are, we are facing a, a very immediate choice. Uh, we, can, we can have a treaty which would, uh, which would put very strong constraints on the use of autonomous weapons, or we can begin an arms race. Uh, and if you look at the likely outcome of that arms race, um, it seems to be a future where uh, the capacity to kill millions of human beings would be in the hands of essentially anybody who can afford, uh, you know, maybe $20 million to buy a million uh, microscopic robots. So you can build a microscopic robot, a small flying robot, uh, that carries a one gram uh, high explosive charge, um, which is enough to blow a hole in, in a human being's head. Uh, and there's really no serious way to defend yourself against a large cloud of insect-sized robots. You can't shoot them down, uh, you can't fight them off, uh, and you don't, need, uh, you don't need a large number of supporters, you don't need a big civilian infrastructure, you don't need a large military to run this. At the moment, the thing that prevents uh, mass uh, death uh, is the fact that in order to carry out mass death, you need an awful lot of people. If you want to have a nuclear weapons uh, capability, you need a huge uh, scientific, industrial, and military infrastructure to carry that out. If you want to kill a million people with rifles, you need a million soldiers. 
Uh, you can't have a million soldiers without five million civilians to, to support them and feed them and train them and look after them. Uh, so nation states can do this kind of thing, but individuals can't. When you have fully autonomous weapons, then you can launch an attack against a city of a million people just with money uh, and weapons, and you don't need all the rest of it. Uh, so it creates a situation where the balance of power is tipped away from nations uh, and towards non-state actors or nations that are irresponsible uh, and aggressive. So it seems clear, to me at least, and to many other people in the community, that this is a direction that we don't need to go. Uh, and in fact, the Financial Times had an editorial uh, in support of the open letter, which was written by 3,000 AI and robotics researchers. The title of that editorial is A Nightmare That We Don't Need to Invent. I think Mr. Russell is right, and uh, we should be prepared, and we should discuss more about that uh, issue of you know, up, applying AI to uh, wars. And, uh, and uh, my opinion, my thought is to you know, uh, move that, uh, that technology, you know, advancement of technology, more, towards more uh, consumer-oriented businesses and industries. And I think, uh, you know, I said about human-robot interaction, and human interaction with artifacts and, you know, artificial things are, is, uh, is a field uh, with, uh, uh, you know, great amount of future for, not just for academia, but also for industries and uh, consumer-oriented businesses. And that is because, you know, uh, uh, if humans want to, uh, Know, communicate with uh, artificial and artifacts, uh, and uh, you know, our AI can support us uh, to buy your uh, big data analysis or machine learning or any other things, uh, deep learning and other things. Or, or since humans are very sensitive to very subtle, you know, or feelings or expressions and eye movements and other things, and. Uh, but still, uh, AI is uh, more oriented to kind of single or double or triple purpose, you know, or uh, goal oriented or you know, technology. And uh, human interaction with artifacts are more than that. And I bet that, uh, uh, of course, uh, learning medical care and uh, judgment, you know, human judges, are an us and design and creating or, you know, or more kind of, uh, of uh, futuristic things uh, are you know uh, waiting for us, uh, you know businesses, uh, and not just for academia. And I like uh, I'm you know uh, to turn that you know, energy for you know AI war uh, to that sort of you know or human you know, oriented uh, businesses and technology. That would be the most important and. Uh, ELSI issues, social or you know, legal uh, movement would support us for that. So that's a very serious topic, I think. Um, another issue I think uh, we should all start discussing and addressing uh, is the issue of jobs. Um, so I think the future of AI is bright uh, and a lot of work will be done by machines, a lot of will, wealth will be produced by the machines, but there will be a transition period where uh, jobs will be taken uh, from uh, humans, and uh, our uh, policymakers uh, will need to start addressing this issue. Uh, so, Arthur Clarke once said, uh, "The future, uh, the goal of the future is full unemployment, so that we can all play." <laughs> um, and I, I do believe in that. It's just that we have to rediscover the rules of play, uh, what it means to play. That means everybody having a turn, and I think uh, policymakers will start. Uh, start to um, address this issue uh, pretty soon. Could, could you, just, just for one minute, because I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of play and nobody having to work, but could you just speak to what it means for everybody to have a turn? Um, yes, so I do think uh, in some future, uh, AI will uh, do a lot of work for us. And uh, it could happen that humans don't need to work uh, in, to, to make money uh, or to, to produce things for ourselves. Uh, humans do engage in things that are not work. For example, uh, we play sports 
that's not that's not because you know we, uh, it is it is something to challenge us it is not because you know uh, putting uh, a ball in the basket gets us you know it doesn't produce anything um, but it is to challenge us so we do engage in activities which are challenging for us rewarding for us not necessarily to produce uh, anything out of it uh, just for the intellectual challenge uh, just just to push ourselves and uh, our society can be taken you know we we didn't have sports when we were hunters and gatherers uh, we were we all, almost all the time were spent in uh, searching for food technology enabled us to have more time for leisure entertainment etc and i think that can happen in the future as ai does more of the produ pr production for us uh, we just have to uh, like you know deal with it we we just like you know right now a lot of our economic systems are built around scarcity and uh, um, fighting for resources um, and that even that might go away and so we don't we we just have to manage that transition period well thank you I guess I would, um, uh, let me switch a little bit around. Um, when I'm thinking about the future impact of AI, one of the questions I keep asking myself and my colleagues is, what are the possible advances that could happen in the next, let's say, five to 10 years that would really be game changers in terms of the economy and, and beyond? And I just want to throw out a couple ideas that I think are, are likely game changers in the next five to 10 years. One is autonomous driving vehicles. We already have prototypes that demonstrate that cars can be driven by computers more safely in many cases than they can be driven by people. Eventually society will get into that and I think that will be in the coming five to 10 years. The ripple effect of that is huge. How many jobs today um, are effectively jobs of transportation that involve people. Uh, second one, uh, what if computers, and I believe this will happen, has a good chance of happening in the next five to 10 years, what if computers get to the point where they can read, really read, like you and I read, and understand text in its full meaning? I'm not talking about a search engine that can find web pages containing the words you type in. I'm talking about a computer that really can read and understand a document, reason about it, summarize it for you, answer test questions, decide whether it agrees with that document or not. That would be another game changer. And once computers can read, they'll read the whole web. They'll be better read than we are by a factor of a million. And it'll, that'll be a game changer. There'll be many jobs that we do today that are based on knowledge that we've acquired by reading that'll be a game changer. A third one I think is just the whole area of medicine and the thing that's going to make that a game, a game changing economic situation is the huge volume of new data that is being collected on our bodies from smart watches and other devices so that um, coupled with machine learning is going to just change the whole game in terms of effective medical treatments that are possible and there will be a huge economic ripple effect of that. So I would just throw those three out as uh, among my top five likely to have a huge impact on the economy and beyond in the next five to 10 years. So I think we've heard, we've heard um, very top of mind concerns about uh, autonomous weapons, which um, you know, a, a thing I think is, is very present, how we might shift uh, to AI to support more consumer-oriented yeah. businesses, how we might be able to deal with the jobs issues that are raised by, you know, imagining a future perhaps where we're looking for challenges like sports, but we don't have to fight for survival in a way, the way we do today with our work. And um, these ideas of game changers, autonomous driving vehicles, and how much uh, of work is involved around that. What if, what if computers really read and understood the way we do and um, how, how they might understand medicine through all the data that's now gathered on all of us every day. I, I think maybe this is a good time to ask uh, if the audience would like to ask a question or two of the panel as well um, in areas that are of concern to you. And I think there's a, a microphone around. There it is. Please, um, there's one right in the middle there, please, right there.
just identify where you're from, please. I'm uh, Martin Brunska company, Airmobile. I just want to caution us against this vision of future where we don't need to actually work because the computers will do all the work for us and we, um, you know, we can just have fun and have a good time because there are not just economic reasons, but there's also deeply psychological reasons why people have jobs. And actually, if you look at what country is feeding European country most terrorists or recruits for ISIS in uh, the Middle East, it's probably France. And these people are people who don't quote unquote need jobs. You know, they are young unemployed uh, uh, people of uh, Arab, originally Arab origin who don't have jobs because they're ostracized, but technically they don't need, uh, they don't need to work. They can just, uh, you know, enjoy, do sports, yet they feel there's, that there's something deeply wrong with their lives and are kind of feeding this type of problem. So I think that a future where uh, we'll have this amazing AI, we'll do all the job for us, all the, all the you know, searching from food to whatever, and we just have a good time. I think uh, it, it kind of uh, ignores a lot of these potential problems stemming from human psychology. Thanks for the comment. There's a question over here. Hi. Uh, this, I'm Ravi Brooks from MIT, Rethink Robotics. Stuart, I promised I wouldn't ask a question, but I want to give you a, you a chance to redeem yourself. Um, <laughs> Uh, by uh, posing the question a little more crisply that you answered, I think in a way that may mislead some people. Um, you, you were asked about killer robots and you answered about uh, weaponized robots, weaponized AI systems. But I think a lot of the popular press, when they talk about killer robots, there's a myth, I call it a myth, going on that we're soon going to have AI systems which are going to get tired of humans, are going to decide to get rid of the humans, are going to eliminate humans which is very different from a weapon system. And, and I just want to give you a little chance to uh, uh, expand on your answer beyond that thing which is of great passion to you to the other way it may also be interpreted. Yeah, no, I, uh, I don't think I misspoke. I don't think I implied that we're talking about uh, killer robots that will turn on the human race no, no, but I, but I think and destroy was, it. That was how the question could be heard and your answer was about a particular aspect of it. And I think that's where the press sometimes gets confused. Okay, so, so just in case there was any confusion, and I don't think there was, but in case there was, uh, we are talking about weapons that are uh, at a high level controlled and directed by humans and used by humans against humans. Uh, and this is not sort of us as in humanity versus them, the robots. This is us, humanity versus us, humanity. Uh, and you know, we have a long record of misusing weapons uh, and this would just be uh, a continuation in a, in a perhaps much more severe form of that glorious or inglorious history. Um, so I just want to come back to something that Dilip said about uh, that our policymakers are, are thinking hard about the future uh, when there is no work. I'm touched by Dilip's uh, confidence in our policymakers, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm a little skeptical that they really have an answer. Uh, to the question, and I think the gentleman uh, said, uh, put his finger exactly on the point, that, uh, that just left to ourselves to play, uh, we're not necessarily terribly good at, at organizing ourselves to do that in a constructive way. Uh, that we need to actually have, uh, should we say, a migration plan, a transition plan from the kind of economy we have now to some future economy uh, where people still feel engaged uh, and valued for what they're doing uh, and part of uh, a larger enterprise or effort uh, that, that gives a, a sense of value to the individual. Um, we have absolutely no idea transition plan. I think um, that, that raises a question for me anyway, or probably for a lot of us. Like, what, what are some of the, you know, what is a future you'd like to start to see? What are some of the transition plans we need to put in place to get there? Uh, as Stu said, it is very hard to see um, because, um, so one thing that we don't know is what the timelines are. Um, so policymakers uh, are compelled to action only when they know what is going to happen and when. Uh, so we, we have only uh, ideas about, uh, especially these uh, futuristic things where 
uh, people don't need to work anymore. Those are, we don't know when exactly that is going to happen. So that is, that is definitely a challenge. Um, and, uh, and also how exactly is it is going to unfold, which, which jobs are going to go first. I think, like, you know, in, in near term, we have uh, good ideas on, you know, which, you know, for example, as uh, Tom uh, mentioned, um, driving jobs are going to go away. And uh, some jobs about you know reading and understanding text and summarizing them those are going to go away. Uh, we can plan for the, those, but what's the next wave is harder to predict, and that is that is the challenge. Yeah. I've been working for a long time in fields of uh, cognitive, so-called cognitive sciences, including uh, psychological and brain uh, sciences, and uh, from that viewpoint. Uh, there are so many unexplored uh, topics and uh, fields for uh, human minds, and uh, we need to. Uh, it, it is uh, pretty urgent that uh, we need to explore that sort of you know, or internal processes of human beings to apply those kind of things to uh, create more you know advanced technologies and uh, also to create you know, more. Uh, Created, uh, create jobs. You know, uh, there are well, so many unexplored jobs uh, are waiting for us. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, design, or you know, of course, medical care, and uh, also education, learning, and uh, the kind of things are uh, you know are quite unexplored fields for businesses and also academia. And I bet that uh, they'll, uh, we can, you know, explore and uh, we can create more kinds of businesses and more kinds of jobs uh, in future. So uh, I, uh, I'm not quite pessimistic about that, but we need to prepare for that, prepare for that, and we need to uh, invest some money at least towards that future society. I would just add to that. Um, First of all, I guess I just want to say that I agree with the speaker in the audience who suggested that people want to do something with their lives. They want to understand that they're moving forward the world and society in some way. And so uh, it's more than playing tennis, um, although tennis is fun. Uh, but when it comes to policy, as Stuart mentioned, we really don't understand what that future exactly is going to look like. So it's hard to prescribe. Um, what those jobs will be. Given that situation, the smart policy thing, the smart policy move in my mind, is to look at the education system and how to change that to prepare for the day when it won't be uh, that you'll have one job throughout your lifetime, but instead it'll be that you will, the progress will be happening quickly enough that you'll probably have multiple jobs through your lifetime. And so uh, one policy uh, decision or topic that could be studied is the idea of changing the grain size of education from, for example, four-year study to become an expert in some topic so that you can work for 40 years in that area to perhaps um, instead just-in-time micro-education and uh, a kind of educational system where we can perhaps subsidized by the increasing wealth pie provided by automation, um, be able to dip into and learn new skills that allow us to move in and make new kinds of contributions that we couldn't foresee when we were a kid choosing our major. I think this touches on an interesting area too. I mean, classically, policy and regulations follow technology. And now you've mentioned investing. We've mentioned a couple of ways for us to be adaptable, maybe education is one. Is there any advice we can give to, to policy to help make that more adaptable so they can respond to the technologies as they continue to shift around us? One piece of policy advice that I think makes sense is measurement. That is, government should be measuring uh, the progress of technologies, making predictions not just of what next year's GDP will be, but what next year's and five-year horizon technical breakthroughs are likely to be. You can imagine my friend Yoav Shoem has suggested that just like we have a stock index and a futures index, perhaps we should have an AI index. That is a collection of 
quantitative measures of progress and uh, anticipated progress in the field that could then help governments track what's really happening and what's really anticipated to happen so that they could respond with policies that are appropriate. So I think um, one of the problems perhaps with economists is they're extremely good at analyzing uh, an economic system and saying, you know, yes, this would work, this is incentive compatible, uh, the various participants would all play their role in such a system. Uh, or this other proposed economic system would fail because these, this group would defect uh, or it would, there would be imbalances that would diverge and so on. But it's not part of the training of economists to invent new kinds of economic structures and systems, new kinds of societies. Uh, and in fact, if you ask, you know, whose job is it to do that, uh, you'd have to say science fiction writers. <laughs> so I think what policymakers should probably be doing is in some sense recruiting uh, the best science fiction writers or people related to that, people who, who are able to imagine different kinds of systems and have those people sit down with economists and, and get some, some real world feedback on the realism of their, of their various uh, ideas. But it seems to me that this ideation is absolutely central to what has to happen uh, because absent that, absent a real goal towards which policy can move, we're likely to drift in the direction uh, that's happening right now. Simply uh, greater and greater automation, greater and greater concentration of wealth, uh, and gradually discarding larger and larger parts of the human population, uh, and perhaps providing them with, uh, with a s subsistence wage, uh, but no real meaning to their lives. Uh, probably if they were just being given a subsistence wage, then there's no need to educate them anymore. Uh, so we'd probably you know, reduce the amount of money put into education, as we are already doing. Um, so it seems like things are going in, in sort of the wrong direction uh, in this sense, uh, and it's because, I think, of, of lack of a goal uh, towards which people can make changes. Uh, I agree with uh, Stu Russell that uh, I like uh, economists to do more uh, things about the, uh, you know, deal with the concept of uh, information and, you know, our economics or, or you know, academic, uh, uh, I mean, our academic economics uh, should more, you know, be concerned with uh, information and uh, which is uh, dealt by AI technology. And uh, I don't think, I, I'm of course a, a novice in economics, but uh, I bet that our economists are, can are, you know, more contribute to our, ours, our, you know, our fields by you know, concent being concentrated more on, their, on dealing with the concept of the information uh, to be introduced to the economic field of economics. And one more thing is that about policy. And uh, our, my organization is, uh, is GSPS, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, which is a represent the, the representative organization of funding agency uh, for Japanese government. And uh, that sort of uh, agency is located in uh, every, uh, almost uh, every country, of course, including the United States, like NSF. And uh, probably we need to communicate to each other or start to communicate to each other about the, you know, or what the impact of uh, the investment of AI technology for the future. And that's, uh, I think, one urgent problem I learned from this panel. Yeah. Thank you. So um, these are some, you, you've left me with uh, some real thoughtful things here. So, I, you know, the struggle for timelines, although it, it's sort of interesting to me that AI has been something that's been coming for so long and some aspects are already here and some we don't, we don't know where they, where they are yet. How important it is to develop the cognitive sciences alongside of it. Um, how hard it is to, uh, because it's hard to prescribe scenarios, some ways where we might get more flexible, whether that's looking at the education systems and how they, they work, and also thinking about how we might ideate to look forward and to have goals to prevent a really sort of dystopic scenario that I think it sounds like there's some concern on the panel um, that we would like to avoid. And, and 
always important investing in the future. Now, that makes me want to just turn to the audience and ask if there are any last question or two that people would like to. I see there's one on the left-hand side there. Yes, Siona's Precinct from Manpower Group. So what I'm curious to hear from the panel is the evolution of mankind and progress that has happened with the disruptive technologies from a historical perspective has always ended up in the same place, which is greater wealth creation and after a reasonably sizable time of disruption, especially as it relates to jobs that were replaced or displaced, more people eventually found more jobs uh, because more categories were created. So if I look at this change, why would AI be any different than what we've seen over the last 250 years? Because I'm sure that if you were in England in the 1860s and you're, you're running your loom at home or you, and your steam engine comes in, you would say, wow, this is a big change and the world is, is really about to change. And in the end, it evolved you know, for the benefit of, of those markets and for the world at large. So why would this time things be so different that we shouldn't expect after a time of disruption, wealth creation, uh, be distributed roughly in the way that we've seen it uh, historically. Why is AI different from anything else? Why is AI different? Why would this time in history be different than all the other times when we've experienced disruption that have caused great wealth over, over time, of course? So, um, so let, let's think back to the, uh, the uh, agrarian revolution and the industrial revolution. Um, and the, uh, the, the work that humans could do by virtue of their physical capabilities uh, has, has largely disappeared. Uh, and the same is true for horses. The horses didn't have their minds to fall back on. Uh, and so uh, when you look at what happened to horses, the number of horses in the US, I believe, went from 80 million uh, in the mid 19th century to just about 2 million uh, in the early 20th century. So. Um, so they lost out big time. Um, they became cat food, basically, uh, because they couldn't fall back on their minds. The human, uh, the human race fell back on its mind, uh, and most of the work uh, going on now involves uh, some uh, application of the mind. The difference about AI is that AI also, to some extent, replaces the mental work that humans do. And what else, what's the third thing that humans are going to fall back on? Emotion, em emotional, right. e emotional side, so there's the physical side, the mental side, and the emotional, the empathy side. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, is there an economy built out of empathy? Uh, and uh, <laughs> as yet, no, not really. Uh, empathy is, is, is not a terribly highly valued uh, thing. There are, there are some uh, job categories that involve mainly empathy, uh, some kind of social work, uh, certain kinds of caring jobs. But these are actually very low pay, um, you know, personal therapy. Uh, if you go to some parts of California, that's a very large uh, employment category, uh, personal therapy, psychotherapy, massage therapy. Um, but it's hard to imagine an entire economy built out of that. So that, that's the open question. Thank you. I think it's a pity that, I'm so sorry, that we're, we're actually out of time. And I think this point on this high note, actually, of intelligence, you know, I've been reflecting as we've been talking about how these machines are in many ways smarter than we are. They are our partners and we're theirs as we go forward to a future of a, you know, a more, I'm going to put quotes around it, intelligent world, where, as, as you'd said at the beginning, um, many things that come that are good for humanity come from our intelligence. And I like the idea of the empathy economy. Maybe we can explore that in a future session. Thank you very much. <laughs>